I'm going to talk sh a little bit about uh, the southern border of the United States, uh, sort of from an operational perspective and based on my time down there at the U.S. Embassy as the program manager for the FBI's uh, portfolio involving counterterrorism and counterintelligence. Um, just by way of background, um, I spent about 26 years in the FBI, and I actually worked organized crime for about 10 years focused on Chinese triads, Italian mafia, Russian organized crime, and so forth. And in the late mid-90s, I got interested in terrorism based on some research, and because terrorism was beginning to move up in terms of priority in the FBI. After Pan Am 103, after the World Trade Center 1 bombing in 1993, the FBI was beginning to prioritize more radical fundamentalist Islamic extremism as a target and as a as an issue regarding national security for the United States. So I got interested in that, and it was a good fit for me because um, working organized crime, you're looking at hierarchical groups. You're looking at groups that are usually drawn along ethnic lines or ideology lines. Uh, many of the techniques that the FBI used, I could transfer over to counterterrorism, and those are things like electronic surveillance, physical surveillance, analyzing the movement of money, uh, developing human informants, and so forth. So it was a good fit for me. I spent a few years working in a joint terrorism task force in Houston, which basically focused on, I was on the international side, we were focused on Hezbollah, al Ghamad al-Islamiyah, we were focused on al-Qaeda at that time, which was growing significantly. So that was really my focus. Um, I also had an opportunity, because I was interested in working internationally, I got involved with our legal attache program, and I had the blessing and the honor to work overseas in South America after the AMIA bombing. I worked with the Chileans and the Argentinians. I worked with the Israelis on a case involving the shipment of US Army surplus goods from the United States to Israel that was uh, targeting uh, Israeli soldiers along the southern Lebanon border. So. I got a chance to work with the Israelis. I got a chance to work with the Brits. Uh, I got a chance to work uh, with the Argentinians and the Hezbollah issue down there, Iranian-backed Hezbollah. So I got an interesting perspective of the sort of the operational profile of international terrorism and how it differed in different parts of the world and how it affected our national security. After 9-11, the FBI decided they're going to put a, a, an international terrorism desk in Mexico. Prior to that, the, the FBI office at the U.S. Embassy, the Office of the Legal Attaché, was pretty much focused on drug trafficking, extortion, kidnappings, uh, uh, kidnappings of uh, uh, parental kidnappings and so forth, things of that nature. Um, after 9-11, um, the focus of terrorism was front and center for everybody, for policymakers, for lawmakers, and for the FBI. We had been punched pretty hard in the stomach, and I was sent down to Mexico. I went down to Mexico and I initially did an assessment and I looked at the situation. What are the issues here vis-a-vis -vis national security, vis-a-vis -vis international terrorism, as it could impact the United States? And, and in a, you know, it was a different time. And in the days after 9-11, failure was not an option. And that became very clear from my bosses in Washington. Failure is not an option. We were focused. And the issues and the threat stream that was coming in every day kept us up at night. Let me talk a little bit about the threat stream and, and what we were looking at and what the issues were. We looked at the demographics in Mexico, and in a country of 87 million people, there were really only about 6,000 Muslims in the country. There were a few small Islamic communities, and we soon realized that there were very, very minimal extremist elements within those communities. So that was not the focus. What became the focus for us was the very sophisticated global smuggling networks that were moving people from all over the world with the end stop, the final stage being northern Mexico and moving those people into the United States. I remember looking at a map that uh, Border Patrol and CBP, when we, when we started working cases and we started working operations, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, we looked at a schematic of the different groups that were smuggling special interest aliens, which I'll articulate in a few minutes for you, but uh, into the United States. And it looked like a spaghetti map where, where people were being moved from the Middle East, from East Africa, from South Africa, from South Asia, through Europe, through Brazil, through the... Uh, through Central America, through Belize, through El Salvador, across the Panamanian Isthmus, 
but it all ended, all roads led to northern Mexico where these folks were then smuggled into the United States. One of the things I looked at was, uh, and as I began my assessment, and I talked to folks who were much smarter than me, folks that were working Border Patrol intelligence, people in CBP, people in U.S. immigration who knew a lot more about the assessment of the numbers than I did, I started realizing that one and a half million people cross the U.S. border in both directions, legally and illegally, every day. And I started thinking about it, and I said, wow, those are some big numbers. And I was told that anywhere from 5 to 10% of those people that crossed the border were OTMs. And I said, what are OTMs other than Mexicans? They were people that came from other countries other than Mexicans. And then we drilled down and we said, what percentage of these people are special interest aliens? And those are folks that come from a country where there is a significant presence of terrorist organizations or terrorist support activity. Countries like Sudan, Somalia, Pakistan, Lebanon, Iraq, Tunisia, and so forth and so on. And that's what we really focused on. And that's the, that's the, the thrust of, 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 of our topic today. You know, when I, when I kind of did that, I sort of looked at the overlay of intelligence and, and anecdotally what we were looking at. And, and again, uh, what I looked at was the fact that post 9-11, when Khalid Sheikh Mohammed was captured, the mastermind of 9-11, and they interviewed him, they interrogated him, they began to find in his writings and in his documents and on his person numerous references to Mexico and, and to the U.S. border. Adnan al-Shukre Juma, who was considered the 20th hijacker, he got spooked just before 9-11 and got out of the country. But he was taking flight lessons with the 19 hijackers in Florida, in Miramar, Florida, prior to 9-11. He spooked and got out of the country. We tracked him in Panama carrying a uh, Trinidad passport. So we knew he was somewhere in Central America, Latin America. We never were able to find him. In 2013, Pakistani special forces shot and killed him in northern Pakistan. So. But, but we knew that he was in Latin America at that time. Numerous detainees when I went down at Gitmo and folks that were being interviewed in Afghanistan and uh, Iraq made numerous references to Mexico and the southern border of the United States. So hearing all that, suddenly my attention span moved up significantly. Um, it became clear to me that the 2,000 mile border between the United States and Mexico, there was a nexus to illegal. Uh, and illegal immigration and human smuggling, there was a nexus and a connection to terrorism. Anecdotally, we knew that three of the 19 hijackers were overstays in the United States. We knew that seven of the 19 hijackers had bought illegal fraudulent documents from day laborers here in Northern Virginia. Um, DHS told me that there were approximately 115,000 uh, special interest aliens currently illegally in the United States, and 6,000 of them had actually been deported and had defied those deportation uh, judgments and remained in the United States. So uh, certainly got my attention. From, from my perch in, in Mexico City, having conducted this assessment, it became clear to me that the greatest concern was the overwhelming presence of these sophisticated human smuggling organizations that existed and utilized Mexico as the final staging point to move illegal aliens into the United States. Um, I'll just tell you operationally, uh, what we did is at the U.S. Embassy, I, I chaired a working group with one of my colleagues from the intelligence community, and we said, we got to work smarter, not harder. And basically, we put together a program to identify those smuggling organizations, those smuggling networks. We did that through good, hard investigative efforts. And it's difficult because when you're overseas, as an FBI agent, I may as well not carry my credentials in my badge because they're useless. I'm on foreign soil. I have no authority to conduct an investigation. I had to do that in liaison with my uh, partners in country. And in Mexico, we worked very closely with the Attorney General's office. We worked with the National Police. We worked with the Mexican Intelligence Service, CSEN. And, 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 and they knew they had skin in the game, and they worked with us because 9-11 impacted them. And I used to make it very clear to them that your resorts are empty. Your rental car places and your restaurants are going out of business. Your number two industry is tourism. 9-11 kicked you or punched you in the gut too. And the Mexicans were on board and we worked very, very well together. But 
in, a, in terms of our operational perspective or, or our, our tack was is to identify those smuggling organizations uh, through good intelligence collection. The Mexicans cooperated with us. There were numerous SIAs being held in Mexican detention centers. I remember at one point in Tapachula, Mexico, which is down on the river of the Guatemalan Mexican border, there were 700, 700 East Africans being held in detention there, Somalians and Sudanese. The Mexicans worked with us. We collected a lot of intelligence from their documents, from their telephones and so forth, and we were able to identify the smuggling organizations and the people that were pulling the triggers for those organizations. And we targeted those organizations. We not only targeted them in Mexico, we targeted them globally. The French, the Greece, and, and others worked operations with us, and we were able to shut down some of those groups. Just anecdotally, I know I'm running out of time. I just want to mention a couple things. A couple cases that came to mind down there and were clear to me was we knew that, and this was as I arrived, George Tajirian, who ran Babylonian uh, travel agency, he was an Iraqi who smuggled hundreds and hundreds of Palestinians and Middle Easterners into uh, into Mexico and ultimately into the United States. George had an extremely sophisticated organization. George was actually an Olympic rower for Iraq during the Olympics, I think 1980 or something. But he had a very successful travel agency and he had a very sophisticated smuggling organization. Another case that I worked very closely with my colleagues at, uh, at uh, CBP, uh, David Ramirez in particular, a good friend of mine, David and I still remain friends, was the uh, Salim uh, Bukhader case, Salim Bukhader, uh Musharraf case, and you can read about that. This was a Lebanese smuggling organization, extremely sophisticated. Uh, Bukhader owned the Lebanese cafe in Tijuana, Mexico, and he had an entire global operation smuggling Lebanese into the United States. He had a whole cadre of attorneys in San Diego that worked for him. Uh, he he uh, had an extremely sophisticated operation. He actually was, uh, had co-opted the Mexican Consul General in Beirut, uh, uh, Imalda Ortiz Abdullah, and she worked with him and she was selling uh, Mexican visas for his, uh, for his subjects that were being bought into Mexico. Uh, one of the things that made Bukhader stand out notoriously more than anything was he actually smuggled a guy by the name of Mahmoud Karani, who was the brother of Haider Karani, the military head of security for Hezbollah. And the FBI captured him in Mexico. He, he was brought into the United States and he was moved into Detroit and the FBI, when they arrested him, they found a ton of uh, videos and jihadist material related to to Hezbollah. Uh, the Somalian Sudanese uh, smuggling group was run by a guy named Mohammed Kamel Ibrahim, Samson Lovelace, and uh, those folks uh, were wrapped up in 2008. So we worked a lot of those cases and successfully, thank God. Uh, I'll just wrap up by saying I, I, I've been removed from, I haven't been in Mexico in a few years, but I'll tell you, I think based on everything we've said today, the issue has become more complicated. And, and I do this when I train, uh, when I do teaching and training overseas of counterterrorism groups is the, 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 the techniques and the problems and the issues are constantly evolving. Today, ISIS is part of the issue. That's complicated things. Everything's moved into cyberspace. And it's not just merely smuggling as we've seen in Europe, but and not only those who are directed or operational, but those that could be inspired once they come into the United States. And uh, I think my time's up. I'll stop there.